Good morning, everyone. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Genesis chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the seat right in front of you. And we are working our way through the book of Genesis very slowly. We're taking our time, no rush. So, this week, we're going to be focusing on one of, one of the most well-known stories in the whole Bible, the story of Cain and Abel, and specifically where Cain murders his brother Abel. We're going to be focusing on verses 8 through 16 today. Last week, we left off in Genesis 4 as the Lord was in the midst of dialogue with Cain. And he left him there with a warning. Do you remember it? The warning that the Lord gave Cain in the end of our, our sermon last week said this, and if you do not do well, in other words, if you don't repent and come to me like Abel did in faith, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. That's the way that we left off last week with the Lord giving Cain this warning. <clears throat> now, in today's passage, we're going to see a lot of dialogue. And I don't know if you're like me, but I love passages where there's a lot of dialogue. Do you know why? Dialogue allows us to investigate motives. When there's a lot of talk happening in the Bible, you should be, this should be a favorite part for you because dialogue, a voice, allows us to see what might be happening underneath the surface. If you know what to look for, if you know what to listen for, you can tell a great deal about what drives a person, what motivates a person by the words that come out of their mouth. Now, it's true what they say, actions speak louder than words, that's a true statement, but sometimes the words can reveal what's actually driving those actions. They can, the words can reveal what the passion is that's making the actions happen. You know, Jesus said a lot about this. In Matthew, in Matthew, there are two times where Jesus talks about the importance of what comes out of a person's mouth. Listen to this. When he's speaking to the Pharisees, which he was always at, uh, it seemed to be in, in battle with, every time they met each other, they were at battle. And it, Jesus says this, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. He says almost the exact same thing a few chapters later, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. What Jesus is saying here is that when we look at the surface, just the very tip of what we can see about a person, we can often tell what's happening underneath of the surface, okay? Two years ago, our, our opening for today is going to go a little bit longer than normal to set up what I think God wants us to see in this, this passage with Cain and Abel. I was reminded of something that happened to me two years ago. I went to a conference for pastors. It was more like a retreat. And a man named Dave uh, Wiedis was speaking there. He was the conference teacher. And Dave runs a ministry specifically for pastors. It's called Serving Leaders Ministries. And all he does for the past several years is he ministers to pastors. Because Dave noticed that there was a, a huge increase in the percentage of pastors that were leaving the ministry depressed or overwhelmed because there was just so much put on them. And so Dave said, somebody's got to do something about this. So he started this ministry just to pastors. And I happened to be at this conference. It was the first thing that I was ever at like this. And something that he said there really, really impacted me. I haven't been able to, to forget it since I heard it. Dave's aim is to help increase the health of pastors, not just the spiritual health of pastors, but their emotional, their psychological, and their physical health. He really wants to help pastors uh, experience a longevity in, in ministry, a whole lifetime of it. Dave spent most of the weekend pointing us to an idea um, that would help us to get to the root of what was overwhelming pastors. It wasn't his idea. This is an age-old idea that's taught in a lot of counseling centers or psychology classes, but Dave reshaped it to help pastors get into deep, deep things in their heart. And this idea was, uh, was called ruling passions, ruling passions. The whole weekend he spent talking about ruling passions. And here's what this is. Dave asks a lot of questions as a, when a pastor comes in and he's overwhelmed. They're the same questions that a, a Christian psychologist or really any psychologist will ask somebody to help get down to the root of the problem. Some of the questions are, are this. What are you most passionate about? What energizes you? What are your priorities? What do your passions positively and negatively, how do they affect your relationships with family, friends? How do they affect your relationships with the Lord? Are there any hidden areas in your life that have the potential to sabotage your life, your marriage, your family, and so on? 
I was thinking about how I might be able to help you understand ruling passions a little bit better, so I put a list up here. These are some of the most common things that end up becoming a passion of something, somebody, something that's real deep down, something they may not even know is ruling them. Just some of the most common ones. This is not an exhaustive list, but self-protection, affirmation, acceptance, adoration, security, comfort, being right, being the expert, feeling good, power or control, conflict avoidance, peacekeeping, impact, looking good, avoiding pain, never being vulnerable, and avoiding abandonment. These are some of the things that when counselors are digging for, they're asking specifically targeted questions to help get to this root, these things, okay? As you look through this list, you may be thinking, well, none of these are bad things, and you're absolutely right. Not one of those things is a bad thing. Tim Keller had something very interesting to say about a person's ruling passions. Tim Keller said this, idolatry is promoting created things, goals, relationships, pursuits, into an absolute and into absolute and ultimate values and replacing God with them or worshiping God in accordance with them. Now listen to this. Sin isn't only doing bad things, it's more fundamentally making good things into ultimate things. Sin is building your life and meaning on anything, even a very good thing, more than on God. Whatever we build our life on will drive us and enslave us. Sin is primarily idolatry. Tim Keller is absolutely right. Most of the things that I've found in my life that end up building a wall between me and my wife, me and my kids, or me and God, most of the time, these are actually good things. Most of the time, what, what Dave Weed has found was that pastors who were overwhelmed had let ministry become the most important thing in their life instead of God. Can you believe that? And so all these good things that we do in our life, if they become an ultimate thing, they become an idol. They become something that we worship instead of God. As I said, this is not Dave's idea, but it comes from a, a very elementary principle in psychology. If you've ever taken a psychology class, you've probably studied things like this. <clears throat> and the Bible has a lot to say about this truth. One of the most popular places was where God was talking to Samuel about Saul. And he said this in 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance, that's Saul, or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. What God tells Samuel here is that people are only able to see the very, very, very tip of the iceberg. What, what really makes up a person's personality is way underneath the surface. And you know, this idea of, uh, of a surface-level understanding of, of people is all throughout the Bible. Jesus talked about that too in Luke 16, 15. Again, with the Pharisees, Jesus says this, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. We sang about that this morning. What people value is highly detestable in God's sight. In other words... What Jesus is saying is that most people only focus on making the very tip of their iceberg, their personality iceberg, look appealing so that others will recognize it and point it out. Ooh, that person is appealing because of this. They're only looking at the behaviors, whereas God looks underneath the surface. Now, this idea of an iceberg is, is really important. I, put, I, I made this this week because I couldn't find exactly what I wanted on the internet, so this is a personality iceberg, and it's not something that's new. Um, as a matter of fact, you know who first taught this? A guy who had a lot to offer the world, and he still does in his writings, and he had a brilliant mind, could have glorified God, God in a lot of his discoveries and findings, but he never did. Sigmund Freud has a lot of good, right teachings that God gave to him, but instead of glorifying God, he glorified himself in it. This is one of the things that Sigmund Freud discovered about personality. He discovered this, that what we're conscious of, our behaviors, are, is the very tip of the iceberg. Just underneath the surface is our pre-conscious, the things we can be aware of if we think deeply about them. Like if we think, why am I behaving this way? You'll probably be able to come up with an idea. But way down underneath the surface, this area most people can never get to unless they go to a counselor for help or a pastor. Help me, I don't know why I'm behaving this way. I'm trying to get rid of this certain thing in my life. What do I do? What's causing this? Sometimes a counselor or a pastor will help people get to this root. And this, this is where your fear and your emotions and your greatest passions live. 
This is what God was trying to tell Samuel, what Jesus was trying to get other people to see. The amazing thing about Jesus' eyes was that the, the eyes of God. He could see, remember I told you a few weeks ago, he could see to the root of people where everybody else, all they saw was the tip of the iceberg, just the behavior. And they got angry at each other and fights happened because all we focus on is behavior. Instead of asking, why is someone behaving this way? What might actually be causing them to lash out or be angry? Once you do that, your anger then turns to probably to compassion and gentleness. Now I know why you're being such a dope, because this is happening. It's very important for us to understand this. Like God, who's able to see into the heart of men, we too can have that ability if we learn to stop looking with these old messed up things and listening with these old messed up things and start listening with our hearts. If you belong to God and he is making you a new person inside your heart, he will enable you to hear with your heart. We sing about it. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. That's what it's, we're asking God to do, to help us to see people as he sees people. Okay? So, with that all in mind, I want us to approach today's text in Genesis 4 like a detective. Like a, maybe like a forensic detective or like a, a psychologist, someone who's trying to investigate the motives behind actions. Because there's a lot of dialogue in our text today, and I think together we might be able to look at this dialogue and determine actually what's happening in the hearts of these three voices we see represented in Genesis 4. In order to make today's message a little bit more memorable for you, uh, I'd like to give you like a title or a big idea that you can take with you so that a year from now, when you're trying to remember this message, you might think back in this. So today's message is called The Murderer, The Martyr, and The Maker. These are the three voices we have represented in Genesis chapter 4 today. The murderer, Cain, the martyr, his brother Abel, and the maker, the Lord God. The big idea for today's message is this. Your voice reveals your ruling passion. Your voice, what you say, what comes out of your mouth, will tell us what's lying beneath the surface. That's what Jesus was saying. That's what God was saying to Samuel. So are you ready? We're going to go into the text today, into Genesis 4, with our detective hats on, and we're going to see if we can determine what is the ruling passion of these three voices represented. Let's read together. Genesis 4, beginning in, chapter, beginning in verse 8. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you've driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be, I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who find him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Let's pray together. Dear God, I come to you in the name of Jesus, asking you to meet us here this morning and to help us in this text. Give us wisdom by the power of your spirit. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so as I said, we're going to be investigating each one of the voices represented here. We're going to start with the voice of the murderer. That's part number one. Are you ready? Here's what I think God wants us to learn in this text. The voice of the murderer reveals acceptance or approval as one of his ruling passions. That's what God showed me as I was listening to his voice this week. Let's see if you can see it too. You ready? We're going to look at each thing that Cain said in the passage and see if we can di dissect it like a detective would. You know, you really got to get your, your, uh, your brain in gear here to see if we can discover what's happening. The first thing that happened is Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. So I want you to imagine this like a movie scene, okay? There are two men standing out in a field. We can't hear what they're saying. The Bible doesn't tell us anything about what this conversation entailed. And so I was thinking a lot, what could they possibly be talking about? Here's Cain 
He was, his offering to God was just rejected, and so he's feeling probably pretty low. We don't know for certain, but he probably was. Probably a little angry, probably pretty jealous of his brother Abel, and so now he goes to talk to Abel. What do you imagine that they could possibly be talking about? We can't hear what they're saying. So if we were watching this in a movie, I would probably be watching and going, can I tell by their body language or their gestures? If Cain is all throwing his arms up, you could probably tell he was seriously angry. He might be ready to kill him right then and there. But we don't have any of that in Genesis 4. So we don't want to apply anything onto the text that isn't there, but we can imagine. And so all we're going to do is step back and think, okay, so with our detective hat on, they just had a conversation, and we have to leave it at that. All that we can know for sure is this. Whatever was said in that conversation leads to murder, okay? So with your detective hat on, this conversation led to murder. That's clue number one, okay? Clue number two, next thing Cain says, I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? The only thing that I can think of to describe the way that Cain responded was the word brash, brashness. Brash is an arrogance that comes out of disrespect, okay? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? I thought that was your job. I'm not God. You are. You figure it out. That type of a response. That's the tone of Cain's response here to the Lord. Okay? And so when someone is brash towards another person, we would say that comes out of disrespect. When it comes towards God, we would say that that is irreverence. Cain was showing irreverence towards God. I want you to think about this. Let's imagine that I offended one of you. I hurt your feelings. And you came up to me afterwards and you said, uh, Pastor Luke, I've got to talk to you for a minute. Yesterday when we were doing the Christmas boxes, you said something and it really hurt my feelings. I know you didn't mean to, but you hurt my feelings. And I went, sorry. You'd say, well, okay. <laughs> you could tell by just the way that I said it that there was no real remorse in my voice, right? Words mean a lot, but the actions behind them also mean a lot too, okay? So in Cain's response here, He's saying to the Lord, I really have no respect for you. I really could care less that you are God and I am not. There is definitely an irreverence or a disrespect in his voice. Next clue. Cain says to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you've driven me today away from the ground and from your face I shall be hidden. I'll sh I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. This is probably the most important clue that we have about what drives Cain. You know why? First of all, it's the biggest chunk of dialogue that we have there. But secondly, I want you to consider something. What would you say about a person? You all know someone like this. I promise you, you do. About a person who every time you meet with them, every one of their sentences seems to either begin with or contain in it the word I, me, or my. I know someone like that. Every single time, it's hard, it's hard for me to even get a word in because they just won't be quiet about me, 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 me. Look at this text, what he says, okay? Uh, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you've driven me today away from the ground and from your face. I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. This is coming out of the mouth of a man who just murdered his brother in cold blood. This guy has either he has the coldest heart in the history of mankind or he really doesn't understand the gravity of what he just did. Cain's response here tells us what is really ruling his heart. It, remember, this comes on the, foot, the foothills of God rejecting his offering. Cain is acting out of rejection, which tells us what probably is ruling him way down here below the surface is a deep need for acceptance or approval. And when he doesn't get it, we see the behavior on the tip of the iceberg. Okay? So it seems pretty clear that at least one of the things that's ruling Cain is a deep need for acceptance or approval. And what happens then, just below the surface? Fear starts to sink in. Whenever something that is ruling a person gets tampered with, often you can see fear start to manage them. Okay? And so for the rest of the, the text we're going to see a man driven by a deeply rooted fear that he has no control over. Think about the statements that he made one by one. My punishment is greater than I can bear. My punishment is greater than I can bear. In other words, Lord, this is going to kill me. This judgment is too much. I'm going to, it's going to kill me. 
Next thing he says, you've driven me from today from away from the ground and from your face I shall be hidden. In other words, I won't be able to make a living without your blessing. It's going to kill me. The next thing he says, I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. In other words, I'm going to be all alone and they're going to get me. This guy, everything he says is labeled with fear. That's what ended up causing his sin. He's a fear-driven man. I was looking into uh, some law enforcement websites this week and articles that were written on the motives for murder. And what what I found really interested me. Can you put that up on the screen? The motives for murder. These are some of the top ones. To keep a secret. Revenge, frustration or hate, money or greed, sex, jealousy, property disputes, a personal vendetta, political, class conflict, narcotics, other felonies, and an urge to protect. And then on this one law enforcement website that was designed to help students uh, who are uh, studying criminal justice, take a look at what it says. The next slide. The three common motives for murder are sex, property, and insults. Sexual rights are a more common female motive. Property disputes are a more common motive when the killer was poor. Now, this is the most important thing. However, the most common motive for murder in general is the petty argument or insult. What does this tell you? It tells us that people end up committing murder when their sense of self-worth or their value is threatened. You insulted me and it caused me to think poorly of myself, so now I'm going to kill you. This says something about where we get our self-worth and our value, doesn't it? It's placed in something other than God, other than what God says about us. And so when someone tampers with it or threatens it, it's the most common motive for murder in the country. The petty argument. I thought that was fascinating. I know a man, a man in my life, who is, he is ruled by fear. Everything from how he dresses to how, what he says to to what he eats, to how he interacts with someone new, it's all based upon a fear in his life. And when you really boil it down to it, any fear that you can think of, a fear of rejection, a fear of change, a fear of the unknown, all of them, when you whittle it down, is ultimately a fear of death. It really is. When you think it through, a guy giving a public speech oh my goodness, I'm shaking in my booth because when I go up there, they're going to hate me and they're going to kill me and I'm going to run out of the room and I'm going to be scared and then my wife's going to leave me and I'm going to end up killing myself. When you boil it down to the very, very end thing, everybody, it's a fear of death, whatever your fear may be. Adam and eight, Adam and Eve were given a death sentence by God. They were told by God, because this has happened, you will surely die. And we already established in our last sermon that Adam and Eve were in the process of training their children, right? You better believe that they told Cain and Abel What happened in the garden? You better believe they told them sin leads to death. One of them probably processed it in a way that led them to a life of faith. Abel, he processed what his mom and dad were teaching him, and he probably ended up saying, I'm just going to live a faith-filled life so that I'll be approved by God. The other one took that information in, and he processed it differently, and it ended up leading him to a hardened heart a life characterized by sin and rebellion, all out of what? Fear, a fear-driven life. Friends, if you're here sitting with me this morning and fear is something that motivates most of your decisions, I want to tell you, it ends up producing in you exactly what it produced in Cain, a life of hatred and jealousy and envy. It will end up destroying you from the inside out. It seems clear that the very, very first voice that we see represented in this text was motivated by a ruling passion of a need for acceptance. That's the first voice. The second voice is the voice of the martyr. The voice of the martyr. And I think you'll see with me here that what ended up becoming a ruling passion of the voice of the martyr is righteousness. Let's look at what, the, what uh, Abel says in the text. And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. I, I got to tell you, I had the most fun this week in this part of the text. I think what, what, I, what the Lord gave me here is really going to interest you. Are you ready for this? Abel never says a single word in the whole Bible. Not one single word, because he dies right here. We don't hear anything that comes out of this guy's mouth. Yet we're told in two different places of the Bible to listen to the voice of Abel. 
Not just here in this text, but also in Hebrews 11.4, which we read last week. It says this, By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And remember this, And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. This is extremely important. And we're going to circle back to this in just a few moments. Keep that in mind. Someone who never said a single word in Bible is represented in the all-star list of Hebrews 11. Keep your mind on that. But let's focus for now on this idea of, in our text, Abel's, Abel's voice crying out to the Lord. This idea of crying out to the Lord is all over the Bible. David cried out to the Lord. Paul cried out to the Lord. Moses cried out to the Lord. And Jesus, while hanging on the cross, cried out to his God, God the Father. Psalm 34, 17 says this, the righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. And you know what's interesting? We really don't have to wonder what it was that Abel cried out. You know why? In Revelation chapter 6, it tells us exactly what the martyrs are crying out. Take a look. Revelation 6.10 says, When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, the Lamb is Jesus, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Abel was the very first voice of these martyrs the first one among many, many people who would give their lives for the sake and the cause of Christ. He was the very first one, the first martyr. And as a a prototype, Abel would kind of lead the way for an entire nation to have access to God through their faith, which would lead to suffering. Israel would suffer, which would then lead to any follower of Christ who would suffer. We're told to what? Pick up our cross. And that's the way that we come into faith with Jesus, by following in his footsteps. What is it, do you suppose, that God wants us to hear from the voice of the martyrs? I thought a lot about that. I think if we could sum it up in one single phrase, if the martyrs were screaming out and we could tune into their frequency, I think what God would want us to hear is this. It was all worth it. It was worth it. Living a lifestyle characterized by risk for the cause of Christ is worth it. Take a risk with your money. Take a risk with your time. Take a risk with your life because if you give your life, this one, for the cause of Christ, in the end, it was all worth it. But don't take my word for it. I want to tell you about two martyrs that gave up their life for the cause of Christ and what they had to say about it. First one is the Apostle Paul. Paul ended up being, I don't know if you know this, but the history books tell us that Paul was beheaded for his service to Christ. They eventually caught up with him. They took one of the greatest missionaries that ever lived, and they beheaded him. And listen to what he says, living the lifestyle of a martyr. One of my favorite verses, Romans 8.18, For I count the sufferings of this world unworthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Romans 8.18. Peter said the exact same thing in a much longer way. Listen to what Peter... Peter was kind of a guy who constantly had his foot in his mouth. Peter always was saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. Listen to what Peter said. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who did not obey the gospel of God? And excuse me. And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. I know that's a long text, text but I wanted to read it because I, I want you to realize that Peter didn't always think this way. 
One time, Peter was having a conversation with Jesus, and he thought he would brag a little bit. Remember the conversation? Jesus was telling people the cost of discipleship, what it would mean to follow him. And Peter thought, this is a good idea for me to go over and get in their good graces with Jesus. And he said, Jesus, we've left everything and followed you. We've left our home and our family and our money just to follow you. And Jesus, I imagine, puts his head down. Oh, Peter, Peter, Peter. And listen to what he says to Peter. Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on the glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. So what he's telling Peter, what he's telling me, what he's telling you, if you risk your life, if you risk your time, your energy, your finances for the cause of Christ, it isn't a risk at all. Don't you know you're going to inherit it all anyway? It all belongs to Jesus. And he tells us that we're co-heirs with him. It's not a risk. Peter, switch your thinking around. You're looking through the wrong lenses, pal. That's what Jesus is telling him. If you become a martyr like Abel, it's the most glorious way to go. That's what Jesus is saying. You may be asking me, about to tell me, Luke, I I know I'm supposed to share my faith more. I know I'm supposed to take a risk and, and go out there and tell people about Jesus, but I just, I have trouble remembering scripture. I'm not real good with my words. I get nervous every time I do it. Remember I told you I was going to circle back to what made Abel's voice so memorable. I want to tell you something. I was looking through Hebrews 11 this week and reading through what made all these people. Hebrews 11, if you're not aware, is a, uh, like a batter's lineup of all these great people of faith, men and women who really just... They set the example for us, how to live a life of faith. That's Hebrews 11. And Abel is mentioned in there, and guess what? He's the only one who what he spoke is mentioned. And it's nowhere in Scripture. Do you know what that tells us? That whatever Abel said, God didn't even find worthy to include in this book. He probably wasn't a very good speaker. And yet he's the only one whose voice made it to the all-star list. In Hebrews 11, not Abraham, not Moses, none of them but Abel. And so what it tells you is, if you don't think you're a good speaker, guess what? Nothing that Abel said even made it into the book. And yet what he said ended up mattering for all of eternity. God will work through people who are just willing to step out in faith. And you'll make it into the all-star list someday, perhaps, even if you're not that great of a talker. Isn't that exceptional? It's exceptional. Abel's silence made him one of the great listeners in the history of the world. If you want your legacy to go down in history, if you want people to remember you as something something great, a great man or a great woman, let me tell you, it's not in being a major talker. It's in being a great listener. You want to lead people? Learn to listen. Will Rogers said, never miss a good opportunity to shut up. I think Will Rogers is right. If you want to lead people, learn to be a good listener. The voice of the martyr reveals righteousness. Abel was passionate about following the Lord. God was his righteousness. That's, how, that's what we can tell by his clues. Voice number three, the voice of the maker. The voice of the maker reveals God's love as his ruling passion. Now you might say, well, duh. But I'll tell you something. It's not as clear-cut as you may think. If you were to ask anybody, you say that the phrase, the passion of the Christ, what would you say is the, the passion of God in sending Jesus? Most people would say, oh, well, that's easy. For God so loved the world, or the people of the world, that he gave his only begotten son, right? So you would say, the great passion of God is people. That's why he sent his son. I I agree with that, but I think it's an incomplete statement. The great passion of God is people, but there's a greater purpose, a greater reason why God sent his son. Charles Spurgeon and Jonathan Edwards, two big thinkers, big thinkers, pointed me to this reason. Listen to what they said. Jonathan Edwards said, it's manifest from Scripture 
that God's glory is the last end of the work of redemption by Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon said the same thing. The great end of God in Christ was the manifestation of his own glorious attributes. What these guys are telling us is that, yes, it is the love of God that is his ruling passion. What makes what is most prominent in the heart of God is that he absolutely loves people, but so that his glory can be revealed for what it truly is. It's the grace of God that led to the sacrifice of his son. So the most important thing in the mind of God, yes, it is people, but so that his grace can be shown for what it is. Now I want us to take a look, put your detective hat back on, at the few things that God says, and see if we can determine this for ourselves. Right from the get-go, we see that uh, God has love for both Abel and Cain. Take a look at it together. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? Here he goes again, asking these questions. And just like a parent, we've said the past few weeks, a parent who asks questions that they already know the answer to is doing this to invoke self-examination. He wants Abel to start thinking, what, what did I do? Can I really hide anything from God? Here God is giving Abel one last chance to repent. He's telling him, God loves Cain, and he's telling him, Cain, where is Abel your brother? You have an opportunity, one more opportunity to fess up what you did. But Cain doesn't. His heart is already hardened. So God has a love for Cain. It's evident in the first question. The second thing the Lord says, and the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Let's stop right there. Here's a love for Abel. God has not forgotten any martyr, not the first one, nor anyone that has come since then. God has a deep, a deep grieving in his heart for those that have gone in the cause of Christ, who've given their lives. The second half of what God says is, is the judgment here. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. We said just a few weeks back, a few weeks back when we were looking at the judgment of Adam and Eve, that most of it was a surrendering to their sin. God didn't do anything to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve did it to themselves by their sin. Did you notice here in the passage, the exact same thing takes place. Nowhere in the entire passage there does God say, because you did this, now I'm going to do this to you. God doesn't do that. You, you can't, it's not in here. He says to Cain, because you did this, your sin has produced something. You did this to yourself, son. Same thing has happened to Adam and Eve is now happening to Cain. I'm not doing this to you. You're doing it to yourself. God relents to, do, uh, to judge people. God wants to do mercy to people. His idea is for Cain to repent, not to have to kick him out of uh, the area. So God has a love for Cain and a love for Abel. It's evident in the first few things that he says. Now on to the very most important thing that I think God says. The last thing he says in this passage is, Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. Now this is in response to Cain's cry that people would seek to do him harm. Now I want you to think this through with me for just a minute as we come to a close here. You're a detective, a police officer trying to figure out how this all fits together. Here you have person A, Okay? Person A has just murdered the brother of, of person B, okay? Or here, person B has lost a loved one at the hands of person A. And you're a detective looking at this scheme. Person A killed a loved one of person B. And yet, person B says that he's going to protect person A. As a police detective, I'd be going, this doesn't make any sense what in the world would drive person B to offer protection to person A? This would drive a police detective mad unless, unless there's a greater story happening here, unless there's something else, other criteria that the detective isn't aware of. Friends, listen to me. The only reason that God would say to Cain, I'm going to protect you when you go out, when Cain just murdered one of God's children is because God had planned this whole event to show his grace. 
Every single time something happens in your life that seems unfair, it is God's sovereign hand planning something to reveal His grace. Are you beginning to see? That's the story of the whole book. Even way back here in Genesis, every single story has the exact same underlining message. Everything that's happening is about this one message. I've created the whole universe to show my grace. It's amazing. The, the closer you look, the deeper you go into the Bible, the more you see it's the same message all the way through from beginning to end. Even here in showing grace to Cain. When we listen carefully to the voice of the maker, the whispering voice of God, way down deep in the pit of your stomach. It's the same voice. The same voice that Cain heard, the same voice that Abel heard. And here's what it says. I'll tell it to you in a, in a poem that I learned when I was younger. Trust me when dark doubts assail thee. Trust me when thy strength is small. Trust me when to simply trust me seems the hardest thing of all. Trust me then through cloud and sunshine all thy cares upon me cast until the storms of life are over and the trusting days are past. God's voice, the voice of the maker, is whispering to you, trust me, don't rely on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge me and I will direct your path. <clears throat> your voice reveals your ruling passion. Colossians 3.15 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Another way to say it is, if there's one thing that is going to determine what makes your personality up way down deep below the conscience, below what you can even determine is there, it ought to be the peace of God. That's what the Lord tells us in Colossians. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Another way to say it might have been, don't let your hearts, the bottom of the iceberg, be ruled by fear. Let's pray together. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Those are your words, Lord. We know your voice. It's a familiar voice to all of us who love you, who call you our friend. And I pray, God, as we Go out of this place. When we look at other people in our lives, I pray that you would open the eyes of our heart. Help us to see people as you see them. Help us to really examine the motives of people that have hurt us, of people that have really said meanful, mean and hurtful things. Help us to see them as you see them. God, we trust you. I pray that you would help us not to have our hearts hardened. I pray that we would be like Abel and come to you in faith. I thank you for your word, Lord, and I pray that you would help us to worship you in spirit and in truth now as we end our service. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.